Okay, welcome to chapter 8 um, again. Uh, I know I repeat this every lecture, but we are covering uh, chapter 8 in Criminal Justice in Action, 11th edition by Gaines and Miller, publisher is Cengage. Uh, this is for Introduction to Criminal Justice here at Wake Technical Community College. Um, I'm recording these lectures for you all in the summer of 2020. We'll be using the 11th edition of the text, which is just slightly different from the 10th if you've seen some of the previous videos or if you have a previous text. Uh, primarily it omits one chapter, the last, and puts a little bit of information scattered throughout. Um, also, I will be supplementing uh, material from the text. So since this class is being taught in uh, North Carolina, this is supplemented with North Carolina law and North Carolina text information. Uh, rather. So um, having said that, let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about uh, some questions. And again, one of the things I always do is um, I preface each chapter with questions that a uh, reader should ask when they are going through um, uh, this course or in life. I mean, I think it's really important that we question uh, the information we're being provided. So um, the first one uh, is the reality in the image. So like the police that you see on TV, all the police dramas that we see, all the ones from the silly ones like Brooklyn Nine-Nine to the more serious ones, uh, you know, even older ones like Dragnet or Hill Street Blues or uh, more modern ones, um, give a depiction of uh, what things are like inside the criminal justice system. And they certainly do that for uh, courts. I think, however, um, what you're going to find is that this reality has um, kind of warped people's appreciation of what the courts are like. Uh, in part because it is a it is a dramatic media. It is a media that is trying to um, entertain, and courtrooms can be entertaining. They can be dramatic, but that's not their function. So who makes up the courts? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who is in the courtroom. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the the three primary players, uh, the three attorneys that are there, the judge, the district attorney, and the defense counsel. But we'll also talk a little bit about the support staff. Does this composition impact how people function? I mean, those people are going to come in with life experiences, some of them are shared, some of them are agreed upon, and that's going to reshape or shape how they make decisions and how they behave. Finally, politics in court. And, you know, I hear many people say, well, you know, courts are going to be neutral or, um, and, you know, that, that can be an ideal one shoot for, shoots for, but um, political power must play a role in any sort of court system, just for example in the structure of what they look like, how many judges there are, what their authority is. These are political decisions made in a democratic society at least by the representatives of the people. So that can shape the court. Again those learning objectives not something you need to uh, overly concern yourself with. It's what we're hoping to accomplish in this chapter. So let's talk about uh, your court gives, your text excuse me, gives Four, primary, four primary functions of the court. First, uh, due process. Remember there is this struggle between this goal and the second goal, which is crime control. The courts, more than the police, are the guardians of due process. They guard your individual rights. If you were coerced into a confession, it's the courts that are going to apply due process and throw that out. Now they also perform the function of crime control. So we see, um, we see that the courts, you know, judge. Big surprise! That's the name of the primary figure in the courtroom. They judge people and they impose sentences. Rehabilitation. Uh, the courts look to treat and rehabilitate criminals. Uh, and you know, this is not as obvious and not as often done. Uh, but certainly, you know, in some cases like juveniles, that seems to be the primary goal in courts. Then there's also a bureaucratic function. Uh, courts have to uh, move paper. They have a workload. They have a system they do. Uh, now, there are certainly just these four are stated in your text, but there are certainly others. Um, 
quick example there if you're thinking about it uh, in Missouri um, many of the local courts are the primary funding mechanisms for the small cities and counties in Missouri uh, and by that I mean if if the court didn't assess, assess fines and make people pay money for violations of law much of the local government couldn't be supported and in some cases uh, in Missouri at least some of the studies I've seen 60 or 70 percent of the budget is derived from these court cases now that really changes the primary thing the court does really to a tax collecting entity um, and this is because of course political decisions have been made that um, you can't tax people for what they want or what they need so you create a penalty system through the courts okay here are two terms that are not in your text but I think are important to know going forward in studying both criminal justice here in North Carolina and I think generally and these two terms are often confused the second term is not heard as much jurisdiction and venue jurisdiction is the authority of a court system to hear a case and we spelled system wrong there ah, I'll change that and clean up which court inside the system hears the case is venue so uh, if you had a murder in North Carolina in the city of Raleigh in the county of Wake the jurisdiction would be the North Carolina court system South Carolina wouldn't have authority over it even if the victim was a South Carolinian um, New Jersey wouldn't have authority over it even if the person who killed the person was from New Jersey so venue is once you've established which system it is which particular court hears it so if you shot someone in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, jurisdiction is North Carolina criminal courts, the venue is Superior Court, County of Wake. Um, criminal jurisdiction is typically based upon geography. So where the murder occurs, where the robbery occurs, where the burglary occurs, that's where we're going to have um, our trial. Now there are a few instances where subject matter matters that the crime is based upon what they are the subject matter of the crime not where it happens for example if you committed criminal bankruptcy fraud um, we don't care if it occurs in Raleigh North Carolina it is going to be tried in federal courts if you committed a hate crime um, some states don't have hate crime or civil rights violation statutes you're going to be tried in federal court. Um, now usually those federal courts are located in or near geographically where the crime occurred though. Alright, state versus uh, federal jurisdiction and state versus state. So first of all, most trials occur in state courts. Uh, easily 90%, I'd probably say 97, 98% of criminal cases are heard in state courts so federal courts are relatively rare now they can be very important because of the structure of the American Republic but most cases come out of state court now occasionally you'll have an instance where both the federal government and the state government have jurisdiction this is called concurrent jurisdiction so again I gave the example earlier of a hate crime let's suppose you uh, shot someone because of their um, let's suppose you're a police officer uh, and you shot someone and you violated their civil rights by shooting them and you committed assault with a deadly weapon so theoretically um, you would be subject to both the state of North Carolina they could try you with assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury and the federal government could try you for a civil rights violation that is not double jeopardy because there are two separate sovereign entities trying you the federal government and the state government um, rarer than that and that, that occurs but it's pretty rare is sometimes two states can have jurisdiction so let's give an example usually what has to happen is parts of the crime occur in both states so let's suppose you're on the border of I gave Virginia here but this is South Carolina let's suppose I kidnap someone in Wilmington North Carolina and then I drive down across the border into Myrtle Beach South Carolina 
and I hold that person for ransom down there. So the kidnapping, parts of the kidnapping have occurred in each state. Theoretically, both North Carolina and South Carolina can try me. And you might say, well, surely double jeopardy applies there. And the answer is no. Again, because it is two separate sovereign entities, both states can try you. There was a, a case that occurred in North Carolina when I first started practicing in the 1980s where something very similar had happened. You had an individual who had committed, uh, was accused of committing a, a crime in North Carolina, fled to South Carolina, part of the crime was ongoing. Uh, he was tried and acquitted in North Carolina. South Carolina tried and convicted him. Okay, there are two broad types of courts. And this can be very confusing for people outside the legal profession. There are trial courts and appellate courts. Trial courts have what we call original jurisdiction. A trial court is going to hear witnesses, it's going to hear testimony, it's going to establish facts. Okay, so there's going to be people in that courtroom other than the attorneys and the support staff. There's going to be the defense counsel representing the person accused of the crime, and there's going to be the prosecution and the judge, right? But they're also going to call witnesses. They're going to say, okay, Mr. O'Malley, you saw the shooting. Could you identify who did it? Or they're going to call um, you know, someone who's going to rule on the ballistics. Okay, doctor, you did the test on these ballistics. Could you share your findings with us? Those are trial courts. They're going to hear this factual information come in, and then they're going to make a ruling. Now, they're also going to make some decisions on issues of law, like is the ballistics admissible? Um, is the witness competent? Is the witness uh, got material? Does the witness have material evidence? Appellate courts are different. Now they have jurisdictions over lower courts, and they do not rule on issues of fact. They don't admit that type of evidence. They look at issues of law, and their decisions are called, or rulings, are called opinions. And that is the written explanation of what they did. And whenever you read a court case, 99% of the time you are reading an appellate court decision. You can read trial court transcripts, but they're relatively rare. Most of the ca famous cases you'll ever read, Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus the Board of Education, um, Matt v. Ohio, you know, any of those um, are going to be appellate court cases. This is the structure of the North Carolina court system. Now you'll notice at the very top we have seven justices in our Supreme Court. Federally there's nine. We have 15 judges on the Court of Appeals. Those top two courts are our appellate courts. <laughs> Below that we have two general trial courts. We have Superior Court, and currently there's about 100 judges in Superior Court across all of North Carolina. And then you've got District Courts, and there's about 250 District Court judges across all of North Carolina. Um, now this is not just for, say, Wake County or Mecklenburg. This is for the whole state. Um, then you have about 700 magistrates, which are going to handle the more minor stuff. So you've got those five courts or quasi-courts. Magistrates, a small claims court. Then you've got your trial courts administrators. You've got your superior court clerks. Um, they, they can push some paperwork that looks very much like um, legal. They can sign certain legal documents, for example. And you'll notice there's a hundred of those uh, because we have a hundred counties in North Carolina. Okay, North Carolina courts, let's look at the magistrates. Now, um, they get called different things in different states. They can be called justices of the peace in some states. They can be called small courts. They can be called limited jurisdiction courts. There's a ton of different names. We call them magistrates. They are going to handle very minor matters. For example, if, if you wind up downtown uh, arrested for something at midnight, there's not going to be a superior court judge on duty in the courtroom at midnight. It's going to be a magistrate usually in Wake County behind a bulletproof glass and he's going to hear was there probable cause for arrest he's going to set a bail usually or bond. Magistrates are appointed 
uh, by the senior resident superior court judge in the in the jurisdiction. So we're in, we're in District 10 of North Carolina. So the superior court judge in Wake County will appoint the magistrates. They serve for two years, and then based on good behavior, they can serve another four, and they can keep getting appointed. Now, when I first started practicing back in the 1980s, um, magistrates didn't even have to have a high school education. Uh, that changed. Uh, there's there's more educational requirements, but uh, one of the things that's happened to magistrates is over time, they have become better and better educated because I really think we're, we're asking them to handle more and more areas of the law, so obviously they have to have more familiarity with the law. Okay, so here are our two trial courts. We have the district court and superior court. Now, district court, remember there's about 250 of those, and there's you know 10 or a dozen of those sitting in Wake County because we have a very large percentage of the North Carolina population. They're gonna handle almost all the minor criminal cases. Uh, there aren't juries in, our, in those courts. Um, they're gonna handle applications for warrants. They're gonna handle um, evidentiary hearings. So district courts does a lot of the grinding grunt work in the court. Not a very glamorous court, very busy court. If you go down and you looked at the calendar for Wake County, um, there's usually two sessions for district court. There's a morning session uh, and then there's an afternoon session. And you know, it might run for three hours between nine and noon or it might run between eight and noon. It'll vary wherever you are, but let's suppose it runs three hours. You easily could have 300 cases scheduled in those three hours. That's 100 cases in an hour. Now, obviously, they're not going to hear most of those. They're going to dismiss them or move them through quickly. Superior Court handles most important felony cases. If you have a murder in North Carolina, a kidnapping, um, you're going to be in Superior Court. Uh, those um, calendars, that's what we call the number of people that are going to be heard in the court, the calendar, um, are, aren't as crowded. All judges in North Carolina, district and superior court judges, are elected. Now there are certain qualifications, um, U.S. citizens I believe is a qualification, <coughs> excuse me, they have to be uh, admitted to practice law in the state of North Carolina. Um, but beyond that, um, people run for office. Uh, and you know we've just decided that it makes the courts more responsive to the people and you know there's there's two and this is something again it could have gone back to the beginning questions to start with is this a good or a bad idea and you know there's there's arguments to be made on both sides and you, you should think about it um, you know yes uh, you're being more responsive to the people that's a positive thing but how much do the people really know about being a judge? Are they electing good judges or are they just electing popular judges? Are popular judges good judges? So there's a, there's a lot of things that go into that and things you should think about. North Carolina has two appellate courts. The North Carolina Court of Appeals, which would hear the first appeal up from Superior Court, usually. And then the biggest uh, court in North Carolina, the North Carolina Supreme Court, again, elected. And whereas, you know, magistrates might serve for two and district courts for four and superior courts for six, uh, generally those terms are longer across the United States in the appellate courts. You're elected by statewide elections. So the last big election, the current uh, Democratic candidate for senator in North Carolina is uh, Sherry Beasley. She was uh, the chief justice. She'd been appointed. She'd been on the bench. Uh, but when the Chief Justice resigned, she was appointed to be Chief Justice. Then there was an election between her and Newby, and Newby won. He became Chief Justice. So she's running for senator right now, which should show you that these are, you know, statewide political figures. They can be quite powerful. Um, the federal court system is a little different, and you'll see a chart in one moment. The federal court system, first of all, we take the whole United States, 50 states and some of the areas like Puerto Rico, Guam, and we break it up into districts. The reason we can do this is, you know, there are some states that have very low populations. The state of Wyoming doesn't even have the same population as the county of Wake. 
So obviously it would make a lot of sense to have just 50 jurisdictions of equal size and numbers. So there's one trial court, 94 jurisdictions. I'll show you some of the jurisdictions there in a second. Then we've got two courts of appeals, just like North Carolina. We have the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. Now sometimes people just omit the term circuit. We call it the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, but properly it's the Circuit Court of Appeals. And then final, at the top, you've got the United States Supreme Court. And this is the most powerful court in the federal government, and that makes it the most powerful court in the United States. And how are you appointed? How do we get judges? Well, all the way from the district court judges through the Supreme Court judges, the President of the United States selects a judge. He is then, there are usually hearings in the Senate of the United States, and they confirm or deny him. So traditionally, there wasn't a lot of fighting about this. There was a little bit. Um, traditionally, also, it was a far more political office. If we look at the um, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, for example, um, let's look in the 20th century. Some of the notable uh, Chief Justices of the Supreme Court was uh, Charles Evans Hughes. You may not have heard of him, but he was the Republican candidate for president. Uh, lost and wound up getting appointed to Chief Justice Supreme Court. Uh, William Howard Taft was President of the United States and uh, after he lost the presidency uh, he ran in 1912 and, and lost in a three-way race between Wilson, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and himself. He lost. In 1920 the Republicans retake the presidency. Uh, the Chief Justice resigns, dies, I believe, and Taft's appointed. Uh, Earl Warren, who, the Warren Court in the 1950s, was appointed by Eisenhower. Uh, Earl Warren was the governor of California, so it used to be a very political position. Now it tends to be more technocratic and ideological. This is the structure of the federal court system. You'll notice that at the very top they've got the United States Supreme Court. Then you've got our 12 Court of Appeals, and there are there's a couple over on the sides. Um, there's some circuit court appeals um, that feed into the Supreme Court. They're, they're, they're a little different. They come out of the U.S. Court of International Trade, U.S. Claims Courts, U.S. Veterans Appeals Courts. You've got the military courts that go to the U.S. Court of Military Appeals. Um, both of those aren't that common. Uh, it's kind of in the middle there where it goes United States Supreme Court, U.S. Court of Appeals then those district courts are far more common. There are a few like the territorial courts I mentioned, Guam, Puerto Rico, U.S. tax courts, uh, courts of the District of Columbia, and then there's regulatory agencies. You can have appeals straight from the regulatory system. This is the geographical breakdown. Now you'll notice it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at North Carolina there, since North Carolina's got a lot of people in it, you can see how we're divided. We've got an eastern district, a central district, and a western district. Uh, so they broke the states into three because, you know, there's a lot of people living here. Smaller states, you'll notice uh, Wyoming, Utah, Kansas, uh, even Colorado, New Mexico to some state, not a lot of people living in them. Single jurisdictional court. California, broken up. New York, broken up. Pennsylvania, broken up. Uh, Virginia, broken in two. Uh, Florida, broken in three or four, I believe. So those are the district courts. Now the different color codes here are the different circuit courts. So you'll notice that we, we broke this up into 13 circuits. Some circuits aren't that important. Um, the first circuit, not very important. Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts somewhat, some important cases, but not too many come out of there, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Puerto Rico. Uh, the Tenth Circuit, not very important. Again, there's not many people living there, same with the Eighth. Um, but you start getting important cases in the Seventh, which has got Chicago in it, and then you get a lot of important cases. For example, if you were focusing on death penalty cases, Fifth District is the district you're going to look for a case to come out of. Um, also, abortion cases tend to come out of the South as well, the, the, the 5th, the 11th, 10th somewhat, the Arkansas cases. Uh, we're not a terribly, terribly important circuit here in the 4th. Uh, the, the circuit court is very important, interestingly enough, because that's where a lot of future 
um, U.S. Supreme Court judges come out of. But the ninth is important because of California. The second is important because of New York, a lot of commercial law. The seventh because of Chicago. The fifth because of Texas and the death penalties. So some of these are more important than others, but these are your circuit courts of appeal. Okay. Here's something that it comes as kind of a surprise to most students. You do not appeal a case saying, I didn't do it. Um, that's not the basis for an appeal. If you were convicted at a lower court, the court has looked at the facts and decided that you did it. If you're going to appeal, you have to show that some of those facts shouldn't have been admitted, that there was an error of law, that the witness was not um, competent to testify, that hearsay was admitted, um, that uh, they didn't meet the scientific standards of admissibility. So to appeal a decision, you have to show a error of law. Now that's usually what you're hoping to show is you were wrongfully convicted, but it's still pretty rare. And this is, again, I think a difference between perception. 90% of cases that are appealed in the criminal courts and the federal level lose. So it means that, first of all, most cases don't get appealed. Second, if you appeal, you're going to lose nine times out of 10. You don't win criminal appeals very often. Okay, let's talk about the big dog. Let's talk about the United States Supreme Court. Now, um, one of the things I usually ask in class is how many justices are there in the Supreme Court? And uh, often the, enough of people in the class will say nine and they'll say, okay, you've got the federal constitution, which is the basically the, the important parts of the federal constitution for setting up the government is Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. Article 1 sets up the Congress, that's the Senate and the House. Article 2 sets up the presidency, the president, the vice president, and Article 3 sets up the courts. So where in the Constitution does it tell you you have nine justices? The answer is nowhere. It's just the number we decided upon. There is nothing in the Constitution that says it has to be nine. It could be seven. Now obviously I think you want a, you want a uh, an odd number, but you could have seven, you could have eleven, and this is one of the interesting fights that's going on. Can you pack a court? And that, really goes back to a case, and if you take our constitutional law class, we'll talk about the court packing scheme uh, by Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. But it's been revived recently, and we'll talk about that. Um, the court has the power to shape the law, and the big power they have is judicial review, which is basically to declare a law unconstitutional. They also have the power to interpret a statute statute is a is a brief snapshot of what we're trying to accomplish and the court has to give meaning to the words having said this there's about 7,000 cases in a year that are appealed to the United States Supreme Court they don't hear most of those cases they they hear only about a hundred to 150 so it's pretty rare if you can't get four justices usually to agree you're not going to hear them so let's talk about this judicial review this is something kind of created in the United States. This is the power to say this law is unconstitutional. This goes all the way back. It goes back to cases like McCulloch v. Maryland. It goes back to cases like Dred Scott. But the interesting thing is there is nothing in the Constitution that says the Supreme Court can declare a law unconstitutional. This is just a decision that the courts made in a case called Marbury versus Madison. Again, take our constitutional law class, you'll hear it. This is just a decision that was made that we decided, okay, we are going to um, have this power. And they very rarely used it for the first hundred odd years of the Republic, a handful of times. Then it got a little bit more common, a little bit more common. Now it's fairly common for the court to do it. Um, if a law is unconstitution, unconstitutional. It violates usually either the U.S. or state constitution. Um, it's uh, it's really part of the living constitution that the constitution changes and evolves. If this isn't in the constitution, and then we just assume that power. Okay, the Supreme Court does not hear evidence. Instead, what happens is the two sides that are arguing, 
and they're usually called the appellant and the appellee will submit written documents and these documents are called briefs now sometimes the court will say well we want you to come in and explain some stuff and that's going to be an, called an oral argument the court then decides how it's going to vote usually what they have is they have a, a vote after they hear and read the briefs and let's suppose the the vote is seven to two or six to three to do something all right then they go to if if he's in the majority the chief justice okay decides who gets to write the opinion now if the chief justice it is dissenter if he voted not to overturn it or he lost then that supreme court judge who's the most senior decide who writes the opinion so they will write the explanation why they're ruling the way they ruled. The majority will. The minority can write something called a dissenting opinion or a dissent. They can say, hey, look, the court's making a, a wrong decision. Also, if you agree, either in the dissent or in the majority opinion, you can write a concurring opinion. So let me give you a practical example. Right now, it's June of 2022. We're waiting for a Supreme Court case to come down written by Justice Alito that looks like it's going to overturn the right of abortion. So there's going to be a vote and as it's predicted and I'm predicting here based upon what I've been reading that the vote was six to three to overturn Roe v. Wade. So they're going to essentially say Roe v. Wade's no longer precedent. So a vote is taken. The three judges um, who dissent um, will each write a dissenting opinion, probably. Sotomayor will probably write the, the dominant opinion, I'm guessing. The Chief Justice is having Justice Alito write the opinion for the majority. So he will write the opinion making abortion no longer a federally guaranteed right and allowing the states to ban abortion. Um, now there might be some judges that are going to agree with Alito's reasoning and they will write concurring opinions. There might be some judges that agree with um, Sotomayor's opinion and they'll write concurring dissenting opinions. So those are the opinions you get to read. But they're, but they're really based upon law, not evidence. Okay what's the role of the judge and we're, we're talking here primarily trial judges so in North Carolina these would be Court of Appeals oh, excuse me these would be district court and Superior Court judges before the trial remember if he's got 300 cases in a day in the afternoon another 300 cases that's 600 it, trust me he is trying to get people to settle he's trying to work with um, the defense and the prosecution to prevent a lot of these cases going to trial so he's, he's helping negotiate. Once the trial starts, the judge should be neutral. Um, he becomes more a referee. He makes sure the law is followed. He can explain points of law to the jury, not to the defendant, by the way, um, but he is a neutral arbiter. He also keeps the docket current and administers the court. He's got the power of contempt, for example. All right, so the judges makes ruling, for example, should the trial continue? Uh, was there probable cause? Should bail be issued? Is a witness competent to testify or is the defendant competent to be tried? Critically, and this is what judges do about 93 to 95% of the time, they approve plea bargains because courts trials are getting rarer and rarer. Now, realistically, no district court judge in North Carolina that has hundreds of cases scheduled in a given day, okay, can actually give individual attention to each one. If it's a major case, sure. But most cases, you've got a speeding ticket, you've got a simple assault where you slap someone, you've got, you know, you've also have uh, civil cases going on. You had a divorce decree. You're just going to have to push paper. Um, and they have a very strong bureaucratic role in keeping the system moving. At trial, he should be neutral. The big thing he does at trial is he publishes his rulings on the admissibility of evidence and witnesses. As an attorney, 
I win or lose my cases based upon the motions I made before usually. Who gets to testify? What evidence gets to be shown? If I can control who's testifying, the content of their testimony, I can control much of the trial. And the judge makes the decision, yes, this gets in, no, it doesn't. He also has the power of contempt. If an individual is acting poorly, cursing, shouting, using profanities, the judge can throw him in jail for contempt of court. He moves the trial forward. He keeps it going. After the trial, if you're acquitted, you're found not guilty, he releases you. Although this, this can be delayed if there's other trials. And if you're free on bond, usually it's much quicker. If you're convicted, he usually will sentence. Now, they're going to have to follow sentencing guidelines. We're going to talk about those when we get to that. But most states have basically a range of penalties, and they let the judge impose it. And um, typically, he can make his personal statements at this point. He can comment. He doesn't do that before trial. He doesn't do it during trial. But he can state how he understood the trial to go after conviction. All right, so how do we get judges? As I said, the federal judges are appointed by the president and confirmed. Now, that's a very quick statement, but i got to take a minute to explain how that's changed. Um, it used to be, uh, till about the middle, the latter part of the 20th century, that pretty much the president would appoint a Supreme Court justice, and they would usually be confirmed 70, 80, or 90 to 1 or 2. It was pretty rare that there was opposition. But gradually, more because I think the court did more and more, and was subject to more and more scrutiny, and it was understood that there was a tremendous amount of political power there, um, it got more and more attention. And finally, it became highly partisan. So what's important is what political party the president is and which political party controls the Senate. So if you had a Republican president and a Democratic Senate, they could refuse to confirm his appointment. Most recently, of course, it was flip-flopped. Um, Barack Obama, uh, chief, one of, the, one of the judges died, uh, Justice Scalia. There was a few months left before the election, um, about a year plus, and, and he appointed to be Associate Justice of the Supreme Court a man named Eric Garland. The Senate was controlled by Republicans. Now, Eric Garland was uh, a qualified judge, but the Republicans, um, and this could have been a Democratic thing, which is using an example, just decided, well, we don't want to put a Democrat on the bench. We'll wait for the election. Hopefully, our guy will win. He'll get to appoint a Republican on the bench. So they didn't even have hearings. So it, the standard, I think, used to be in many ways, is he qualified, is he smart enough to be the Supreme Court judge? Now the standard is, does he match what we want politically? Uh, so Garland was not confirmed, and we have people on the court like Brent Kavanaugh because of that. State judges, you have three options. Uh, rarest, you have a similar system to the federal, and that's only done in three or four states where the governor appoints all the judges. Now, on, in pretty much every state, if there's a vacancy, a judge can appoint a judge. Excuse me, a governor can appoint a judge, um, but later they have to run in elections. Uh, most states use, like North Carolina, an election. Now, it, it, it can be a partisan election where it says a D or an R next to your name, or it can be nonpartisan. And we flip flop. We've gone back and forth in North Carolina about that. A number of states, Missouri is an example, use what's called merit selection, where there's a pool of qualified candidates, the governor appoints, and then there's a confirmation election. Um, they don't get to choose between A and B, but they get to say, yeah, he's good, or no, he's not. Let's confirm him. So how are monitors, how are judges monitored? How do we keep an eye on that? Or famously, quas custodias custodias, who guards the guards? Um, there is judicial oversight. So the bar um, can pull the bar license. If you're no longer a licensed attorney, you can't be a judge. Or 
there is a Office of Judicial Standards that said, okay, you know, this judge was arrested or something, he is no longer capable. The big way you can monitor a judge is you can vote him out of office. You can say, all right, um, we're pretty much done with you. Uh, you're a bad judge. You can be removed for judicial misconduct. That's pretty rare. Um, you can be impeached. Uh, you can be, you can commit a crime and we can throw you out. Uh, very, very rare. Um, all these are fairly rare. Most time judges just continue along. All right, let's talk a little bit about diversity on the bench. If we look at the state appellate judges, who are they? They are white and they are men. So it's worse in some states. If we look at Alabama, Alabama has a significant black and Latino population, but 100% of all the appellate judges are white. Women and minorities are noticeably absent at appellate levels. So why would you want that? And remember, the, the question is, is diversity your goal or is diversity giving you something? Well, one of the things you can argue, and this is an argument, it's an opinion, not a fact, is that people tend to trust judges that resemble themselves. If you were being judged by a ethnic and religious minority that you didn't recognize. So let's suppose that all the judges in North Carolina suddenly were female Buddhists and, or uh, they were uh, transsexual Muslims. You, most people, uh, of course if you were a transsexual Muslim you'd, you'd be fine with that, but for most people since they don't look like them they don't sound like them, they don't share those things, there is an innate, at least at the beginning, distrust of it. Also, a diverse judiciary gives more opinions and voices. You know, I think one of the reasons we had an advancement of women's rights uh, through the 20th century is that there were more women in the room. Women started saying, well, you know, you, you, you shouldn't if there's a domestic abuse case, the question shouldn't be, all right, what did she do to deserve to get hit? Um, you know, you know, why were you mouthing off to your husband? You should start to look at it from the perspective of the wife. All right, a little bit about the courtroom work group. Um, first of all, it's cooperative. It's not combative. Now, you might think, well, no, you know, the defense and the prosecution fight each other. True, to some extent. But trust me, as a defense attorney, I have more in common with the judge and the prosecuting attorney than I do with you as the defendant. And, and you are going to be there for one trial, and I have a relationship that is going to be ongoing with that judge sometimes for years, and that DA. So the most prominent members are the judge, the prosecution, usually called the prosecuting attorney or district attorney or the assistant district attorney, the ADA. And then you got the defense attorneys. You also have the bailiff, who's responsible for the physical security, and different names, but the clerk of court is going to process a lot of the paper, and the court reporters, which are going to make records of the trial. All right. Um, we have an adversarial system. Now, that means that you've got a neutral judge, each side presents evidence and the argument is through this fight the truth emerges um, and if you think about it, I think this is a wonderful example of something we experience in everyday life that we just assume is the normal way to do things without questioning does it work so the basic concept here is by competing and we're, we're very much a competitive society and you know it, goes back to sort of capitalism in some ways. You know, companies compete, they provide the best product. Lawyers compete, they find the truth. Now, you do this within an arena that is decided uh, and has rules. This arena, this courtroom, you know, there are rules. We don't admit just crazy evidence. We don't admit psychics coming in and testify. There are structured procedures. What you can argue, what you can talk about, what you can't. But if you look at um, if you look at this system, um, you know very very smart lawyers, 
um, have real questions about it. Now this quote I have here um, is from Warren Berger who was the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court and he says trial by adversarial contest must in time go the way of the ancient trial by blood and battle. So I'm going to close this lecture with this question for you to ponder. Back in the Middle Ages, you got this medieval drawing here, um, if you had two competing sides, what you would do sometimes, not always, and this is in England, France to some extent, and some others, is you would hire a knight or a warrior to fight, and I would hire a knight or warrior to fight. And we believe, since God controlled the universe, and since God would protect truth and justice, that when they fought, he would favor or that the truth would defeat the lie. And the, and the person's soldier, the person's whose champion who won, would win the court case. And this was trial by combat. Now, there were other things associated with that. There was trial by ordeal. Um, but you might you might say, well, that's crazy. You know, what if a guy slips in the mud? What if the guy has indigestion in the morning? Um, you know, isn't there a better system? Well, the, the, the primary alternative people talk about is a inquisitorial system. There are other alternatives, you know, there, but this is the, the major one. And this quickly works like this. Each side gathers facts, and all those facts are presented in a, usually it's called a dossier, to a judge or a panel of judges more often. Usually there's three. Then those judges in a courtroom do a lot of the questioning. They um, essentially are much more engaged in questioning witnesses and examining the truth. And then they make a ruling. Um, juries exist, but they're not as powerful in the inquisitorial system. There are prosecutors, there are defendants, but judges have most of the power. So in our system, I would say the prosecutors have most of the power criminally followed by the judge, followed by the defense attorney in, in the practical sense. Although sometimes you have very powerful defense attorneys, they can overawe a judge or overawe a DA. But since the DA in North Carolina has the power of the calendar, he decides when the trial is, he decides when it goes forward, when it doesn't go forward, and the judge can dismiss cases. I think it's fair to say, really, that the prosecutor and the DA have most of the power. Now, this would give a lot more power to the judges. And, you know, judges in Europe are not elected. So this would be in many ways not as democratic a system. Now, judges in Europe tend to be far more professional. They tend to be doctors. Um, uh, they tend to be extremely educated, um, highly skilled. This would fundamentally change things. Now, I, I said there are other alternatives. Um, you know, one of the alternatives is let's subject this to, you know, a scientific application of the scientific method. Let's, let's, let's study. Okay, if you say the inquisitorial system works or you say the adversarial system works or whatever system you come up with, I don't care, trial by dog, okay, let's do a scientific test. Let's see, let's take the three of them, let's take the same factual situation, the same defendants, let's have a trial in each one, and let's see which gets it right. And let's do this over and over again, and then we would have numbers, objective numbers, that we could play with and say, okay, the truth is found most often in, you know, the American system is right, right? Or the truth is right in Europe, the inquisitorial system is right, or dogs get it right. I mean, I'm just using that facetiously. So one of the things I'm going to leave you with is, um, you know, we're in the 21st century now. Maybe it's time to look at alternatives. Maybe we've got it right. Maybe we should stick with what we have. But maybe it's time to explore alternative ways of running our courts. And I'll just leave it at that. All right, well, that was right around uh, 50 minutes again. Um, I like to keep them right at 50 minutes if possible. 
and whenever you're ready you can go ahead and start the next um, slide. I believe we'll be up to chapter 9 and uh, have a good afternoon or good evening, good morning uh, or have a great weekend if you're listening to this on a Friday and I will see you all for chapter 9 I believe when we return.